Are you feeling the love on Valentine's Day? How about loving the planet? If you're planning a wedding or know someone who is, you need to hear this episode of Growth Busters. Call in, call in, call in, call in, call in, call in. Call the Growth Busters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Today's episode, in honor of Valentine's Day, digs into the environmental impact of weddings. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast. Here we discuss our society's addiction to growth, and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. I'm Dave Gardner. I'm happy to share the mic today with Sarah Bailey of the Center for Biological Diversity. She's written a valuable wedding resource, available now as of Valentine's Day 2019, the Wildlife Friendly Wedding Guide. Sarah Bailey, Endangered Species Condoms Coordinator at the Center for Biological Diversity, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, Sarah, as you well know, love is in the air. We're publishing this episode of the Growth Busters podcast on Valentine's Day. It's a great day also to publish a guide to help you plan your wedding in a very special way. Have you got anything to help with that? I sure do. What would that be? Well, we have put together a wildly friendly wedding guide. And it's a little more comprehensive than your average listicle, but not as intimidating as a whole book with a variety of sustainable options that couples can use when planning their wedding through all aspects of wedding planning. That is pretty neat. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't been waiting for such a thing to be published, but it's a really great idea, especially because it seems like we're kind of in an era of big, fancy destination weddings, which have got to be, uh, they've got to have a pretty big footprint. Yeah. Interestingly enough, because transportation, especially air travel, has such a huge carbon impact. Even if your destination wedding typically has a smaller guest list than maybe one you would have in town, the footprint is still much larger just because of how big the impact air travel is. Yeah. And you know, in the Growth Busters podcast, I spend a lot of time talking with young adults, the people who really are going to be making some of the most important decisions that will impact what uh, life is like on this planet going forward. And they're in that time of life where your friends are suddenly dispersed when you get out of college and you want to go visit them and they start to get married. And so people are hopping on planes all the time. And a lot of the people who have a really strong conservation ethic and are really self-conscious and responsible about their carbon footprint, they struggle the most, I think, with air travel. Yeah, it's definitely... A tricky one, especially when it comes to being a matter of like, do I go home for the holidays? Yeah. And being whether you get to see family face to face. So I think it's tricky with with that because that is, that's an emotionally loaded decision. But the way you can kind of think about it with wedding planning. So um, part of what led me to work on this guide is that I am planning my own wedding. And these were things I was interested in for myself in real time. Uh Uh-huh. And yeah, (laughs) so something that me and my fiance considered was we live across the country from most of our friends and family. And despite it being cheaper to probably have a wedding where we live in the Southwest, we could save all our friends and family the air travel by choosing to get married back home. So it'll be a little more work for us with planning long distance, but, you know, we do appreciate that we can make it easier for friends and family and overall reduce the impact that way. And there's other ways to look at that. You can, you know, with everyone being so spread out, probably someone's going to have to hop on a plane, but you can opt out of the Caribbean wedding if that's not where your, you know, your family (laughs) is. Um, And you maybe choose at least somewhere that's close to a major travel hub. So maybe while people have to fly to your wedding, they at least won't have to also tack on like a several hours road trip on top of that. Now you give me an idea here. The, the, the ultimate geek green wedding would be just com- totally virtual. Have you heard of anyone doing something like that? I have not. I have seen it with destination weddings that often, um, I think like the big resorts will offer like a live stream option ah, okay. <laughs> for people who can't attend, which I think is interesting. It's tricky though, because I mean, weddings sort of like this whole travel to visit family, it's emotionally loaded and it's maybe there's a lot of things that go behind wedding decisions and 
carbon footprint isn't usually one of the ones you hear the most of. People kind of accept budget more as a reason to cut back. But I think largely people, they often think their individual decisions are just this drop in a bucket and a wedding is just a day. But when you look at how many weddings happen, which is over 2 million in the U.S. per year, all these decisions kind of add up. And the more you showcase these sustainable decisions, hopefully the more normalized they can become. Yeah, wow, that is huge. And there's so much to talk about regarding this. And before I get in too deep, I want to circle back because I know our listeners are going to be very curious about, well, how do I get this guide? Is this a printed publication that someone can order and get in the mail? Or do you have a lower carbon footprint approach here? Yeah, we have both. both. <laughs> we do have printed, um, printed on recycled paper. So if people are interested, they can go on our website and request one of those. But we also do provide it online for free. For free, even. Yeah. That is pretty cool. We want to make cool. it accessible. <laughs> so uh, wildlifefriendlywedding.com, is that the place to go? Yes, wildlifefriendlywedding.com. Okay. And we'll be sure to include links in the show notes for anything that we talk about, including that. As a filmmaker, I did a documentary a decade or more ago about uh, bystander behavior and learned a lot about social influence and how we, you know, we are influenced by what our peers do. And I think one thing in addition to just the fact that there are, you said, two million weddings a year in the U.S. and just the power of greening up all those weddings, there's also the the opportunity if you do happen to be someone who is extra responsible, extra aware, and working really hard to reduce their both their ecological footprint and especially their carbon footprint in this day and age, uh, besides leaning up your wedding, you also have a chance to influence everyone who you invite. You're setting a good example for them. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a big part of it is you do it for yourself and then you do it for, you know, potentially setting a good example. And I think besides just kind of talking about it, there's sort of maybe some subtle ways to incorporate that. Like you could have signs at your wedding noting that you perhaps went with a plant-based menu and what are the pluses of that? You know, what were the water savings and how much habitat was saved by that choice? And yeah, I think there's ways to gently educate your guests <laughs> on the choices you made and the benefits of them. Yeah, yeah you can decide how overt to be in your uh, educational process. Exactly. You could have a lot of fun with that. If people have a sense of humor. Some of them will give you some grief about that, but it's something to <laughs> joke about. But everybody will go home and they'll, you know, every aspect of your wedding, when they run into that in some other aspect of their life, they're going to have that nagging thought in the back of their head. Oh, I could have avoided disposable plates at this picnic or whatever. Yeah, because they definitely, it's things that can apply to any sized event you have later on. Just because, you know, if you approach these after having getting married, it's still something you can share with a friend later who's maybe planning or things to remember for any event. So a plant-based menu is always going to be good no matter what the size of the crowd. Yep. So I was really impressed. I've read through the guide and it seems very thorough. I mean, it starts with, I think, what's at the beginning of the process would be the invitation, I think. There's probably nothing earlier than that, except that probably the greenest wedding of all is no wedding, right? Which is another thing when you're deciding whether to have a ceremony or not. I guess the smallest p footprint approach would be on the courthouse steps, I suppose. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, no wedding or a small elopement, obviously the less guests all make it lower impact. But if you can't go that, I want to say go that big, but it's going that small <laughs> with your footprint, isn't always feasible. And sometimes, I mean, weddings are fun. They're a nice way to see friends and family for a nice occasion. Yeah. So sometimes you want to figure out, okay, I am going to have this. I do have a big family and it's unavoidable. What are the choices I can make to be sustainable within those parameters? Yeah. And the truth is hanging out with the people that are really important in your life, the people you really love. I mean, that's got to be at the top of everyone's list. There's no better excuse for Absolutely. a little bit of travel or, or, or something. Uh, hugs are good. Yeah. That's a bigger audience to share your message with, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. True, very true. Hadn't thought about it that way. And so you go all the way then for, through deciding whether to have a wedding or not, uh, invitations, all the way through, I think you even get into the honeymoons, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay, so it's all there. I think 
You could probably add an appendix, you know, the post-wedding vasectomy party, perhaps, or something like that. <laughs> we could. We do talk about the importance of, at the end of the guide, we do talk about how the endangered species condoms could be featured at your wedding, since sort of what most people believe is the next step is, you know, deciding how to plan your family. So the wedding guide also lends itself to bridging into that family planning discussion. So the endangered species condoms are great for a laugh. They can be a fun favor. You can make them your place cards. They work well for that. And, you know, don't forget to pack some for your honeymoon and be safe. Yeah. Now, if you're a listener and you're new to some of this sustainability conversation, you might not know what the heck Sarah and Dave are talking about. And what we're talking about is the role of procreation, the role of family size decisions in both carbon footprint and overall ecological footprint. We are definitely in the era where we have packed this planet. And so decisions about whether to have children or not, how soon to have children, and or how many children to have really is going to impact your footprint more greatly than any other decision you make. So that's why I'm joking about vasectomies, half joking. And that's why I love Center for Biological Diversity so much is because you do have that wonderful endangered species condoms program, which maybe we should talk about since we brought it up. And then we can go back into the wedding guide for a little longer. Sure. So the endangered species condoms, it's condoms we hand out and they come in punny little packages with phrases like before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter. And it's just a way to get people thinking about how our family planning choices can ultimately affect wildlife. Because as our population continues to grow, we do compete with, you know, wildlife and other endangered species for resources and we are pushing them out. So we just want people to think about just looking into what contraceptives work best for them and thinking about if and when they want to have kids and making sure they have the resources they need to meet their family plans. It really is a great way to raise awareness and in kind of a fun way and creative way to get the conversation started. And as you probably know, I've been a big fan of that for a long time and have given away more than my share. And I'll tell you, if I was getting married this year, too late, already been there and done that. But if I was, I I would definitely be putting endangered species condoms in every gift packet for every groomsman, that's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, no, they definitely can make for a great favor. (laughs) So if someone is planning their wedding and they like the idea of having endangered species condoms on hand, is that something that you can make happen? Absolutely. And how do they get their hands on those? (laughs) Yes, so if anyone would like condoms for their wedding or any other event, they can go to endangeredspecies.com, and we have a sign-up page there. They can also email condoms at biologicaldiversity.org, and I will make sure they get sent out. That's great. Thank you for doing that. So uh, back to the uh, Wildlife Friendly Wedding Guide, which I know you guys have called it wildlife friendly because you're the center for biological diversity, but it could just as easily have been named the low ecological footprint wedding guide. Yeah. Yeah. We just wanted to focus a little more on wildlife themselves. Of course. As you compiled this, did a little bit of research and put this together, what would you say are some of the biggest decisions that a couple can make that would really shave the footprint of their wedding? Um, So like we discussed earlier, definitely location Mm -hmm. in regards to how many of your guests will likely be using air travel to get there. So that's a big one. Probably the next biggest impact is your menu, especially in regards to how much meat you're planning on serving. There's a number of ways you can go about it. You can go all the way with a vegan menu or vegetarian. When you compare 150 people eating a beef entree to 150 people eating a vegetarian entree, the reduction in emissions is 75%, and it's 90% when you go to an all-vegan menu. But that being said, not all couples are vegan or vegetarian. For example, myself, I am vegetarian, my partner is not, and so the compromise we came to was all of our appetizers would be vegetarian, and then for our menu, instead of offering a beef option, we are offering a chicken or fish because those are lower impact. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. There are ways you can kind of slowly reduce it, even if you don't go like all the way to 100% vegan. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting, the point that the guide makes about uh, avoiding a buffet. That's something I hadn't thought about. 
Yeah, that, I mean, when you kind of leave it up to people, the portions aren't always as exact as with plated meals. So if you're given the option, a plated meal will also have a lower impact because you're reducing that food waste. That being said, you could also talk to your venue or your caterers and specifically see if they have any plans for leftover food. I've been to weddings where some of the leftover food can be you know, served for a day after party, and that's great. Everything gets used up, so that's awesome. Or sometimes there's an option to have them donated somewhere, um, maybe to like a homeless shelter. So just communicating with your vendors about what your options are, just to make sure nothing goes to waste, because that can be a big issue with weddings. Okay, what else? We've talked about the travel component and uh, food. What would be third on your list? I think outfits are a pretty good one, especially now with renting formal wear becoming more and more popular with all sorts of website options for that. It's totally normal for grooms and groomsmen to rent their suits. Now dress rental is becoming more normal for brides. Mm -hmm. And then another option, which is another thing I went with myself, was purchasing a used dress. Saved quite a bit of money there. And used wedding dresses are great. They've only been worn for a day. (laughs) So you're getting some (laughs) stuff that looks pretty much brand new. I couldn't tell the difference when I was looking around the store. And that's kind of a wildlife-friendly and budget-friendly option. Really? It's got to be kind of like buying a used car instead of a new car. The first user pays the premium. Yeah. You know, Sarah, not only are we working hard on uh, reining in the growth of human population and its impact on uh, the ecological footprint, carbon footprint, and uh, harming biological diversity, but we're also trying to get out of this big consumer culture we have because the more stuff we keep buying and ultimately throwing away, the harder that is on the planet. Uh, You having a strong conservation ethic, I was curious about whether you've taken a different approach to the registry and wedding gifts. Yeah, for sure. So my fiance and I have lived together for a number of years, so there's not much we need for our home at this point. Did register for a few nice kitchen items, but it wasn't like we are looking to, you know, furnish our home from it. So there are some cool registries where you can opt in for cash funds for your honeymoon, and you can still ask for very specific things so people still get that feeling of like, oh, I'm giving you a gift and more than just cutting a check if people aren't into that. So you can ask for different excursions on your trip or even just, you know, covering meals. We also used one called So Kind that's put out by an organization called New Dream, whose specific goal is reducing this consumption. So it's 100% customizable. You can ask for services, even like for the day of, like someone can gift you helping, like acting as your, you know, day of coordinator. They encourage like secondhand gifts, or again, you can make cash funds. So something we did is someone can contribute to our dog sitter fund for our honeymoon <laughs> or, you know, uh, giving, gifting us like a date night. So we are kind of, we're looking for more of that experience type gift than actual material things. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Charitable giving is another one. If you have specific organizations that you hold near and dear, and that's also something that's common maybe in lieu of favors is making a charitable donation like in your guest names and then like, you know, letting your guests know that's what you did. And, you know, they, you can always put up a sign for them to learn more about these organizations that you care about. The guide has quite a few links in the registry department. So some really good suggestions there. Uh, if it's all right with you, I'll include maybe a couple of those links in the show notes. But otherwise, I really want to encourage listeners to get the Wildlife Friendly Wedding Guide to get all of those links. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like a good plan. Yes. It's an easy read. And as you mentioned, it's available as a free download from the website if you want, but you can also order it if you'd like to have a hard copy. And, and you know, that could be a nice gift to give a couple that you know are uh, just starting down that road. Yeah, I know. We definitely just kind of came out of that holiday and New Year's engagement season. So I'm sure there's lots of people kind of getting ready to start the journey of wedding planning. And I'd just like to highlight there's a number of things and we really encourage it's not an all or nothing. You can find anywhere within your wedding to make a greener choice. And even some people, the sustainability option may not be their primary reason, but it's still cool to know that that's an additional outcome. So like the used dress, you get to save money most likely, but also you get to know that you're helping reduce the use of resources because you are not creating a reason for another dress to be produced. So yeah, there's a lot of good options and there's quotes from real couples and pictures from weddings for inspiration. So that's a very nice 
<laughs> visually <laughs> appealing guide to look at. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you for doing that. And, you know, and I'm just going to fawn all over you, Sarah, because I am just such a longtime fan of the Center for Biological Diversity, one of the few environmental NGOs out there that really speaks and communicates frequently in campaigns, honestly, about the role of human population in the sustainability equation. So thank you for doing that. Do you have any uh, news that you can share with us about uh, what's coming up this year in the population and sustainability program at the center? Yeah. So actually, you know, we're hoping to reach out to more environmental groups and get more environmental groups talking about population and its impact on the planet. We're working on developing a toolkit to kind of make an easy resource for them to share that. And also working with other reproductive rights groups and kind of drawing that connection between reproductive rights and the environment together. Because when people have the resources and education they need for family planning, we can begin to slow and stabilize population growth for the the betterment of the planet. Excellent. We also have folks working on food and energy. So we're looking at reducing meat consumption, getting more plant-based options in schools for school lunches, reducing food waste, fighting some of the monopoly utilities that block solar power as an option in different communities. So got a lot of work in a lot of areas. And biologicaldiversity.org is the main website. And like I mentioned, we'll include links in the show notes. And one link will definitely get you to the population and sustainability program. Coincidentally, I noticed in early February, February 4th to be exact, a pretty impressive press release issued by the Center for Biological Diversity. Headline was, Rapid Population Growth in West at South Comes at High Cost to Wildlife. Bravo. Yeah, so that's in reference to the census numbers coming out for the year. They actually usually come out towards the the end of the previous year. So normally we would have seen them right around the holidays at the end of 2018, but because of the government shutdown, (laughs) they did not come out till just recently. But yeah, so there's a lot of growth. I mean, in the country as a whole, I believe we've added about 2 million people since the same time last year. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of the growth is in the West, which is, you know, troubling with, it's already stressed out areas resource-wise, especially with water. It's also a hot spot for public lands and uh, the current administration, you know, trying to open up these lands for resource extraction, which is not great. And just kind of another way that showing how our resource use is pushing wildlife to the brink. That's their habitat. And we're opening it up for mining. Whenever the U.S. Census Bureau releases population estimates, they have different times of year when they do estimates for cities versus states versus nationally. But whenever they release these estimates, the news coverage is completely the opposite of what's in this news release that the Center for Biological Diversity issued. All the talk out there is about who ranks first, who has the fastest growing population. That's their goal. That's a metric for success. Does that just drive you nuts, Sarah? Yeah, and especially what's come out a lot recently, too, is the birth rate slowing down. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of panic around that. But what people don't usually focus on with that is that it still is growth. Our birth rate has been (laughs) dropping, but it's still positive. We're still adding people to the country every year. And that amount of growth, particularly with American consumerism and consumption, is still unsustainable. Yep. It's a never-ending supply of uh, boosterism, whether it's intentional or not, for me to be out there busting. So Growth Busters isn't going to uh, be out of work anytime soon, unfortunately. But uh, having great partners like the Center for Biological Diversity helps, and having news releases like this helps because we've really got to get the news media to start telling uh, a different story. Yes. Well, any last words of wisdom before we wrap it up, Sarah? If you want to learn more about the endangered species condoms or receive some to hand out anywhere in your community, they're not just for weddings. That would be endangeredspecies.com. And if you are interested in the wedding guide, that's wildlifefriendlywedding.com. Also, we're interested if you've already been married and have made sustainable choices. We'd love to hear more about that. All right. Well, check the show notes for links to all these things that we've talked about and especially to find the... uh, wildlife friendly wedding guide and i want to wish you success sarah in your wedding and your marriage and your parenting decisions going forward thank you 
as you know, you or any of the other fine staff there that are working on this subject, you're always welcome to come back anytime you have something to talk about. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Sarah. Before I go, I want to share a few things. First, this comment from a listener in response to episode 23 of the Growth Busters podcast, What Do You Do When the End Is Near? Jean wrote, I was one of the first to implement recycling programs in the Twin Cities. I have worked my entire career trying to change people's behavior to not waste resources. I appreciated hearing that although it won't solve the climate crisis, it does help people feel personal responsibility can make a difference. I just spent the weekend reading A Finer Future. I recommend it as it discusses strategies at the global level. Particularly, the chapter on growth would interest you. It is no longer about the rich getting richer. That is no longer sustainable, and other civilizations have collapsed when inequality is tipped too far. We are fighting for our lives. Activism, not hope, as Paul Hawkins says. Thank you. I also appreciated your links to hear Greta. Well, you'll be glad to know, Jean, that I am reading now A Finer Future and a not-too-distant future episode of the Growth Busters podcast will include a chat with Hunter Lovins, one of the co-authors of that book. Finally, in the breaking news department, an interesting development. We've been talking a lot about the failure of the recycling industry. It just doesn't seem to be working out. And... uh, (laughs) Now, where do you begin? First of all, there's an awful lot of people who aren't recycling, and it is so easy. Second of all, a lot of people think recycling is the answer. If you're recycling, no need to worry about living in a McMansion, keeping the thermostat set too high in the winter and too low in the summer, taking lots of jet airplane trips, and generally living big as long as you recycle. And here's this. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, just 9% of plastic was recycled, 16% of it was burned, and 75% was sent to landfills in 2015. Not going too well. So I was very interested to learn about LOOP, which is a new program with a mission to eliminate the idea of waste. Loop takes up the first part of the mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle, by creating returnable, reusable packaging for common consumer items. There are some big names in the consumer products business who are giving Loop a try, and these include Procter & Gamble, Nestle, PepsiCo, Unilever, the Clorox Company, The Body Shop, and Coca-Cola. Here's what we know. You order a product from the Loop store, and that product is shipped to you. On the first transaction, there's a deposit for the container. But once you return the container to the store or send it back in the reusable shipping container, you get your deposit back in full. So what Loop is all about is durable, reusable packaging that also allows companies to make containers that are more functional. Basically, what Loop involves is reusable containers with a deposit attached, just like the jugs of milk from your childhood. No more hassle from trash and recycling. Simply drop your used empties back into the Loop tote and schedule a free pickup from your home. And then Loop automatically replenishes the products that you send back so your favorites are available when you need them. So we do not have to depend, one, on people actually being willing to recycle, which seems to be a problem. And second, we don't have to depend on the recycling industry, which seems to be just utterly failing. So that's going to be interesting. I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, Seems like a lot of shipping involved, but uh, we'll see. All right, that brings us to the close of another Growth Busters podcast. Don't forget to explore issues at growthbusters.org. Subscribe to the podcast on your podcast app. And please give us a review and rate us if you like what we're doing. That will help other people discover this podcast. Meanwhile, if you haven't seen the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, it is very easy to find at growthbustersmovie.org or on Amazon. Until next time. Some may dream to pay mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's 
for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters. 